morning and welcome to another edition of Film Nut. I am your host, Jeff Schubert. Glad you can join us for tonight's show. To catch up on past episodes, you can go to thestream.tv slash filmnut. And to follow us on Twitter, you can go to at the film nut. And we are now available on iTunes, so yet another way to connect to the show. Didn't even mention Facebook. Well, to connect to distributors and for raising funds, it can help to have a good producer's representative or entertainment lawyer to help you navigate the shark-infested waters of Hollywood. My guest tonight, Mark Litwack, happens to be among the best in both capacities. His filmmaker clients have had award-winning films in Cannes, Toronto, Telluride, among other festivals. During Sundance, three clients of his had films acquired for distribution. Hustle and Flow, which won the Audience Choice Award, landed at Paramount, The Matador with Miramax, and Marilyn Hotchkiss's Ballroom Dancing and Charm School, landed with Goldwyn. Mark is also the author of six books, including Real Power, The Struggle for Influence and Success in the New Hollywood, Courtroom Crusaders, Deal Making in the Film and Television Industry, Contracts for the Film and Television Industry, and Risky Business, Financing and Distributing Independent Film. He's also the author of the very popular CD-ROM program, Movie Magic Contracts. On his website, marklitwack.com, you will find all kinds of information, resources, blogs, articles, answers to frequently asked questions about distribution, what kind of company to set up, things to look out for, and a lot more. It's definitely worth a look if you're into film, writing, directing, anything to do with filmmaking. Personally, I first encountered Mark about six years ago after I had completed a no-budget film called Walking the Walk, available on Netflix, excuse the personal plug, and I submitted my film to him for representation. I was looking for a producer's rep. Like most other reps, he passed on it, but unlike the other reps, he took the time to write me a lengthy email. He was praising my work. He gave me specific critiques, things he liked about it. I can tell he really watched it. But he talked about the challenges of getting it out there, and he finally offered me some advice in this email. That was something I sincerely appreciated at the time and appreciate to this day. It meant a lot. So with that, it is a pleasure to say, Mark Litwack, welcome to FilmNet. Hello, sir. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks, thanks for inviting me. My pleasure. You probably have no idea what my movie was or ever writing that email, but it, it was very gracious of you at the time, and I really appreciated it. And I thanked you for it, and we emailed back and forth a little bit on it, and you gave me some more advice, and that was very generous. Well, you're welcome. <clears throat> I actually don't remember it. But <laughs> of <that's> course. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, a, a question that someone like me, a host of a show, would ask someone like you, an expert in your area of expertise, um, well, if you had a son, uh, what advice would you give him as if he wanted to enter the film business? But in this instance, you actually have a son <laughs> that's in college <laughs> entering the film business. So what advice have you given him and has he listened to you? Well, <clears throat> um, you know, uh, the film industry, you know, making films is an artistic endeavor and um, it's a very uh, risky business as all artistic endeavors are. Um, and you have to be uh, willing to um, uh, realize that um, unlike a lot of other professions, um, there's no clearly defined steps to progress. I mean, if for instance you want to be a lawyer, uh, you pretty well know what the path is you have to take. You have to usually go to law school, you have to pass the bar, you have to get that first job, and you know, it, it's pretty apparent you know, what you need to do to succeed in your profession. But when you're dealing with an artistic endeavor, whether it's plays, films, books, um, there are no rules that if you follow it, you have a great chance of success. Because essentially, for filmmakers, you're selling a story. And so my advice to filmmakers are, is that what you really need to do is have a really good story to tell. And I think some filmmakers get a little bit too much um, fixated on the technology and um, you know, learning how to move the camera. And, uh, and uh, at the end of the day, if the film is really entertaining and the story resonates with the viewers, they're willing to forgive some technical deficiencies. But if the story is boring and that doesn't interest them, it won't matter that the pictures are crisp and clear and beautifully shot because they're just not interest, interested in the story. So you have to keep that in mind that really the most important element in a film is that it has something interesting to say. And, and, uh, you know, and it's, it's difficult sometimes for young filmmakers because they have limited life experience and they may not have something that's all that interesting to say yet. You had a client, I believe, who did a movie about wrestling 
And there's a good story with that in terms of how we self-distributed it, correct? A client of mine named Jimmy Petula made a film called Reversal the Movie. And um, it was a somewhat autobiographical film um, about a father and a son engaged in high school, you know, wrestling, amateur wrestling, not professional wrestling. And uh, it was a nice film, but it didn't have any stars in it. Um, <clears throat> it's a family film. And um, we were able to, you know, uh, show it to a bunch of distributors and got some offers, none of which were all that impressive. And he decided to self-distribute it. He took it out um, in the Midwest where wrestling is very big. It's not that big a sport in LA or New York, but in the Midwest it is quite popular. Um, and um, he opened it in seven cities on screens and um, he spent about $75,000 and he made about $75,000. And after six months of doing that, he decided he doesn't want to spend the rest of his year breaking even. So he went back home to his um, garage in Malibu and cleaned it out and hired some neighborhood kids, put in some computers, and they started trading links and hooking up with all these wrestling sites and wrestling organizations. And basically, through word of mouth, was able to sell over $600,000 worth of DVDs uh, at $29.95 each. Well, the cost of making a DVD is about a buck and a half with packaging, you know. And so it was enormously profitable. We also got him a regular distribution deal to get the film in Blockbuster and regular retail stores. But, you know, the percentage of each sale that he got on that was minuscule compared to what he got by selling it directly to consumers off his website. So not only a good creative story, but a good creative marketing plan. Yes, because it's a niche product. Right. And if you have a niche product, you have a, a, an identifiable audience for your project, especially if you can tie into them. I mean, a lot of these wrestling organizations, they have websites, they have mail serve lists, and once you tie into them, he didn't even have to pay them anything to promote his film. They just, the word spread like wildfire, and there aren't that many films directed specifically to this demographic, and it sold extraordinarily well. Something that was broader would, would have a much more difficult time. But this is one of the reasons why niche films can often be quite successful. Uh, gay and lesbian films, for instance, they, there's a community for them, and there's publications for them. There's the Advocate newspaper, and you don't have to buy an ad in the New York Times to promote them. And if you tie into that community, and people like it, they endorse it, they refer their friends to it, and word of mouth is the best form of advertising by far for films. So it's funny, you were talking in the beginning, no prescribed path for the artist, which is obviously very true. I feel like sometimes, a lot of times, filmmakers or some filmmakers, I should say, they're always looking for the secret or the trick or the way. It, it gets back to, like you said, great story, things like knowing your audience, um, networking, being up to date on uh, social media these days, you know, has entered the fray online, the different ways to distribute it. There, you know, there, re there really aren't tricks and shortcuts. It, it, it's, it gets back to some of the basics that have been around for years. Well, I think, I, I believe that if you make a really entertaining picture and people look at it and say, wow, that's amazing, and they start telling their friends about it, that um, it will succeed <laughs> no matter what you do. The word will get out there. I mean, nowadays, especially with, with the internet and email, you know, if someone goes and sees a film and they like it, they come home afterwards and they email their friends, and it's amazing how fast the word spreads. And if the, wor and if the movie is bad, even if it's backed up by a major studio, it's not gonna make any difference. The word gets out very quickly to stay away from it. Right. Well, I mentioned you authored six books. I want to read a quote off of one of your books and get your response to it, if that's okay. So let's see. This is from uh, Risky Business, Financing and Distributing, Distributing Independent Films. Newcomers may not even be able to spot sh the sharks because they are charming, well-mannered, and highly educated. The sharks know many ways to defraud, cheat, and take advantage of novice filmmakers, and they can be ruthless. Those are some strong words. <laughs> what, what exactly are you talking about, or what's a specific example of what you're talking about there? Well, I think a lot of um, filmmakers spend a great deal of time <clears throat> um, working on their craft, as they should, and learning how to tell a good story and how to make a good movie. Um, and the business aspects of uh, distributing and marketing films is not something that they're that aware of, and they often get taken advantage of, and they make, I've seen, Filmmakers with really good films get taken advantage of and sometimes not see any money, even though their films are, are sold around the world. And so they have to be careful, you know, and, and uh, you know, the so really- So they make a deal with the distributor and they get taken advantage of because the distributor takes advantage of them how? 
Well, the distributor is, is you know, a business person and they're trying to get the best deal possible. And often they'll give the filmmaker a contract that's skewed heavily in their favor and the distributor understands the contract. This is their world, this is what they deal with and it's confusing and, and a lot of times if the filmmaker doesn't have any uh, other filmmakers or an attorney or an agent or someone to advise them, they don't really understand what the deal is that they're in, into and whether it's a good deal or, or a bad deal and, and they just sign the contract. And these contracts are often, if they're not negotiated, they're often heavily in, in favor of the distributor and the distributor gets to deduct all kinds of expenses without any kind of limits and takes huge distribution fees and nothing flows back to the filmmaker, even if the filmmaker has made a really good film. And so <clears throat> I, think they, I think filmmakers really have to be careful. You know, the, the, I mean, most distributors are smart, savvy business people. The ones that were overly generous are out of business because they didn't survive. Right. So they're all that way, but some of them are not just smart and savvy, but they're actually kind of sleazy and don't even live up to the one-sided contracts that they may have. And those are the ones in particular you need to be careful about. And the sleazy characters don't necessarily look sleazy. They don't necessarily, you know, uh, have chains around their, gold sure. chains around their neck and look like they're some sort of a pimp or something. They, they, will, they will look very presentable and because... And they'll tell you how great you are. And, and how yeah, and they the have very nicely thing. decorated offices right. and, you know, and they're charming and they're often literate, but, right. you know, but at the end of the day, you know, if you want to know about a, about a distributor, you, what you really have to do is check their track record. You need to talk to other filmmakers who've done deals with that distributor. Now, there's different types of distributor. One type of distributor is what's called a foreign sales agent or an international distributor. And there's about 200 of these companies in the United States alone. And these are small independent distributors. These are not the major studios, Paramount or whatever. And this, they distribute a lot of the independent film. And, and some of them, a lot of them are relatively mom and pop operations where they're just a few people running the company. Um, and you need to do your due diligence and you need to talk to other filmmakers who've done deals with them and see if they live up to their promises. If they don't live up to their promises, even if you have a rock solid contract, all you're doing is setting yourself up for a really good lawsuit, but you don't really wanna be in the business of chasing after these people to get paid and to live up to their promises. You wanna be in the business of making your next film. You know, one of the resources you have on your website is, I think it's a clearinghouse where filmmakers can put their opinions or document on a scale of one to five their experiences with the distributors they've done business with based on you know, when they get paid and follow through on some of the things we're talking about. So yeah, I mean, this is your work, your passion, your art. You definitely want to do your due diligence, call, find out from other filmmakers, uh, deal points and distribution agreements. You know, there should be things like out clauses based on performance of the company, right? Um, there should be maximums on how much they can spend for marketing and those sorts of things. I mean, there are certain items, there should be audit clauses, right, where you as the filmmaker have a right to audit the books and, and see if, if the accounting's correct, things like that, that's what you're Absol talking about? Oh, absolutely, you need to have uh, audit provisions that allows you to audit the books to check whether the accounting is good. You need, you need you know, provisions that say, if they're not paid on time, that you get interest on the late payments. Um, uh, we usually put in a clause that says that if you do an audit and you, you uncover a significant discrepancy in favor of the distributor, that they reimburse you for the cost of the audit. Um, you, know, you need to uh, closely cap and limit expenses. Um, you, know, you need it to be expenses just for your film. You, you try to eliminate any kind of cross-collateralization of expenses with other films. Um, you know, there's a whole bunch of things you need to do, and if you don't do it, you know, you're not likely to see any money, even if you make a good film and the distributor does some business with it. Yeah. Um, I did get a distribution deal for my little film back then, by the way. Uh, it was initially a seven-year contract, and, you know, if not for my lawyer, it probably would have stayed that way, but then we got a performance clause put in, and I wound up getting the rights back after two years because they didn't sell the amount of units that the contract called for. I would have been stuck with them for another five years if not for that. Yeah, that's called a performance milestone. And a lot of times distributors will ask the filmmaker for a term of 20 years and the filmmaker says, well, that seems like an awful long time. And they'll say, well, that's, that's what everyone does or agrees to, and, but it's negotiable. Yeah. And um, I, would, I would usually not agree for a filmmaker to enter into a deal for that 
term unless they were writing a huge, huge check. Um, it's better to enter into a deal where the initial term is only two or three years, and if they meet their performance milestones, if they return X number of dollars to the filmmaker, they get an automatic extension. As long as, as, long as the distributor is actively selling and promoting the film, uh, paying the filmmaker, there's actually very little reason to find a different distributor. Um, but if they give up on the film, which often happens after the first few years, it just sits there, they're not doing anything with it, there's 18 more years to run on the contract, the filmmaker wants to do something with it, the distributor is doing nothing with it, and they don't have the right to do anything, and, that, and that's, that's terrible. Okay, let's go to the chat room and see what's going on in there. Mr. Fantastic. Does he think too many young new directors get ahead of themselves, i.e. Troy Duffy? Well, <clears throat> Troy Duffy um, uh, perhaps <laughs> um, got a bit ahead of himself on his first film, The Boondock Saints, and he was offered a deal and uh, uh, I guess had a falling out with Miramax, but ultimately the film got made and actually the film did pretty well, um, made a and, and a sequel was was made. And uh, you know, uh, I think you know, I don't personally know him, and and uh, you know, don't represent him. Um, but it, from what I've heard secondhand, it it sounds like you know he was a bit arrogant at the beginning, um, and um, uh, but apparently did did have some talent and did have a script that that had some appeal. Okay, um, now a film when it's done. There are so many different things you can do with it these days. In the old days, you just made a distribution deal and that was it. Now, when do you recommend giving, let's say, all the rights to one entity, or when do you recommend splitting the rights and doing different things with them? It's rare to give all the rights to one entity. Um, and that's because you have to understand, you know, there's a whole bunch of different types of company that call themselves distributors that are quite different from one another. Uh, one type of distributor we already mentioned, a foreign sales agent. This is a distributor who licenses your film around the world to other distributors, local distributors. So they'll take your film to AFM and to Cannes and to Berlin, and they'll have a, a booth or a suite there, and they know the buyers from Turkey, and they know what a reasonable price for your film is in Turkey, and they know how to deliver the film to the Turkish buyer and collect the money. And that's a whole bunch of skills and relationships that most filmmakers don't have. Most filmmakers don't know anyone in Turkey, and they right. wouldn't know how to go about selling licenses their film there. And if the sales agent, the international distributor, is honest and does a good job, they're well worth their commission, which is often around 20%. Um, but those distributors, and there's a whole bunch of them, their expertise is in foreign distribution. Most of them don't own any distribution apparatus in the United States at all. They don't own any theaters in the United States. They don't own any home video labels in the United States. They don't own any television networks in the United States. And if you give them your domestic rights, they're just gonna turn around and middleman the deal and set it up with, it, with those domestic distributors. You might be better off just doing it directly with them. So even among domestic distributors, there's a whole bunch of different types of distributors. There's some that are theatrical distributors that release films in theaters. There's others that are television distributors, HBO, Showtime, Stars, um, And there's some that are home video labels, which basically manufacture the film on DVD and get it out there in stores and Best Buy and Walmart and whatever. Um, there's and hotels and yes, airlines. There, yes, and there's all different types of rights. So, uh, and you have to, when, when a company says they're a distributor, the question is, well, who do they distribute to? And do they distribute directly to them? There's only a handful of companies, for instance, that, that uh, sell to uh, Walmart. Um, yeah, most of the other companies have to go through an intermediary company. And so one concern of filmmakers are when you're dealing with people is you don't want to keep going through a whole bunch of intermediaries if, if you can avoid it because each person is taking some commission or some piece of the revenue. And at the end of the day, what starts out as a river when it comes down to you is going to be a trickle. Right. So you, know, you have to be conscious of that. Now, sometimes it makes sense to make a deal with a company and let them sub-distribute through other companies. They may have an output deal that's, that you can take advantage of and it's good, but you just have to be conscious of this and, and you know, put pen to paper and figure out if this is a good deal or not. And ideally, you would want to work top down and try to get the, a theatrical deal first before, let's say, a DVD deal, correct? Well, it, the, the traditional uh, w uh, way that windows are arranged is, is theatrical, home video, and television. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Um, but there are sometimes exceptions to that. 
and uh, it's very hard to get a theatrical release these days, and it's not always beneficial. Um, Harder than ever, would you say? Um, it's pretty hard. <laughs> it's yeah. pretty. It's pretty hard. There's a there's a glut of product out there for. I'm talking about for independent films. Right. You know, you have to realize that the, the major studios are your competitors here, and um, you know, if you're in a in a contest convincing a theater owner to to show your film, you're an independent filmmaker, and maybe if you're really prolific, you make one film every two years, and you're up against the 20th Century Fox that is, that is releasing 18 films a year, in a shoving contest over the theater, you're gonna lose, <laughs> because they have a lot more clout. They have a whole pipeline of films, and the, the theater owner is gonna be more interested in, in, in keeping their relationship with Fox than with you. So, so it's an unequal you playing, know, field. playing field by far. And theatrical release is very expensive, so it doesn't always make sense. Now, theatrical release can be very gratifying to the filmmaker because he can invite his parents to come to the theater and watch his film, and, and most filmmakers really want to have their film shown you know, in public in a theater and not just on television or home video. But if you have to put up a whole bunch of money you know, for the marketing of it, you know, it may not actually be profitable. It may be ego satisfying. So you have to consider these things. Of course, if you get the film in theaters and it does well, it will increase the amount of money you're going to get in home video and television significantly. So, but it's often hard. To, it's often hard to say. So sometimes, you know, if you're an independent filmmaker, if you really want to get your film in a theater and you're willing to put up the money to do it, you can hire people, you can, you can do a rent-to-distributor deal, and you can put up the P&A, prints and advertising, and you can get it out there, and maybe you put it in a few theaters and see how it does, and see if you can come up with a good marketing campaign. And if it does really well, the word will get around very quickly, and you'll probably get offers from other distributors or other exhibitors who want to show the film. Is that a conversation, though, you'll have with your clients? What's the best approach to to go first? You, yes. Okay. Yes. I mean, typically when we're seeking distribution for films, um, there's a couple of rules that we follow. Uh, first is never tell the distributors how little you spent making the movie. That's like playing poker with your hand open, okay? And a lot of filmmakers think, well, I spent $200,000, but this film looks like it's $5 million, and I'm going to brag about it, and, and that's, that's not a good idea to do that, okay? Because that's not, that's not a big news item anymore. A lot of low-budget films have turned out well, and you're just hurting yourself in, in your negotiations. Um, secondly, you know, depending upon the type of film, if it's a film that would appeal to festivals, you may want to release it first in festivals to try to build up the prestige and the stature of the film. And there's a whole hierarchy among festivals. You know, Sundance and Telluride and Tribeca are up there at the top, and there's a lot of whole bunch of smaller festivals. If you premiere your film at one of the smaller festivals, you may make yourself ineligible to play in one of the bigger festivals. So that's, that's a big mistake. Now, not all films are festival films. If it's a very it's a genre-oriented film, it may not be something that, that you even want to spend the time trying to get into festivals. But if you get into a festival, even if you don't win an award, even if there isn't a bidding war trying to buy your film, you're going to come out of the festival with some prestige from just getting into one of the top festivals. And secondly, you're going to get a bunch of reviews. And those reviews can be very helpful in persuading a distributor to release your film because you're giving them ammunition they can use to sell the film. I mean, when you try to market a film, you can't just say to moviegoers, this is a great film, because right. everyone is saying that about right. all the films, okay? But if you can put some quotes from the New York Times or Vanity Fair on your poster, and you can say that you won an award at Sundance, well, a certain number of people will be convinced to come and at least taste it. And you know, that's what you want. You want a number of people to come and taste it. Hopefully they'll really like it, they'll rave about it to their friends, and it will snowball, and it will attract through word of mouth a big audience. Chum Lodio would like to ask, does an unknown screenwriter have much chance getting their script read in today's film industry without connections? Are they better off trying to get a book deal and then getting noticed by Hollywood that way? Well, <clears throat> it's, very, it's very hard for most um, unknown, unproven writers to get an agent. Uh, the agents are generally interested in people that they can readily sell. And if you think about it, agents are working on a commission for in, in Hollywood, it's 10%, and 10% uh, of WGA scale is not a lot of money, whereas 10% for you know, Tom Clancy's you know, book is, is a lot of money. So most agents 
much prefer to represent those people who probably don't even need agents because they're so desirable and so many people are chasing after them. And it's very, very difficult to get agents even to read your work. Um, um, I would say nowadays, you know, one way to break in if you make a really good film, uh, really, if you write a really good script, is to see if you can hook up with a filmmaker and actually just make it as an independent film and, and get it out there. And uh, that's a possibility. Getting it published as a book is not easy either, by the way. I mean, book publishing is also very competitive. But yes, if you get it published as a book, and especially if it comes out through a major you know, imprint, and if it does well, they will definitely get the attention of a lot of producers looking to adapt books. Is that where the internet kind of serves like the, maybe the farm system also for the film industry in that um, you can make an independent film or you can make a, a short and you can develop a web following, whether it be YouTube, Crackle, Hulu, one of these many other sites. Is, is that a path that you're more encouraging of? I think so. I, I think, you know, uh, I, I think basically no one really knows what's going to work. You know, if they did, it, all the studios would only make successful films. Right. <laughs> so, and that's clearly not what happens, you know. And keep in mind, the major studios, they have a lot of money. Their average cost of films is over $70 million. They spend another $20, $30 million minimum to market them. They, they can hire the absolute top directors, writers, actors, and yet many of their films you know, don't resonate with audiences and don't succeed. And so with all that expertise and all that market research, they're still most of the time getting up at bat and not doing that great, you know, it tells you something. And, but that's, that's one of the great things about the film business is that it's inherently democratic. I mean, there aren't a lot of businesses where the small entrepreneur can actually break into the business and succeed in a big way. Um, you know, uh, in the film, in, if you were in the oil business, for instance, and you wanted to break into the oil business and you're competing against Exxon and Shell, I mean, all the big oil fields have been bought up and the cost of entry at this time would be impossible, you know, to break into that business. But in the film business, really what you're selling, the commodity you're selling is ideas, stories. And every, anyone can have a good story and there's no guarantee that someone who has a great track record, that his next idea is going to be one that works. So all the time, every year, you see some people come out of nowhere with some stories, and, and maybe it's my big fat Greek wedding, mm -hmm. and no one, no one wants to distribute it, and boom, all of a sudden, it takes off and is a huge hit. Mm -hmm. And every year, there's a, f a few of those, at least, yeah, that break through. So it's, it, compared to a lot of other businesses, it's much more democratic, it's much more it's much more possibility hard if you make something. Hard but opportunities exist. Yes. Website guy would like to ask you if you have any thoughts on the SAG AFTRA merger. Well, I think it's probably good for SAG and AFTRA. It it's, um, it's, this doesn't make a lot of sense these days. I mean, traditionally, AFTRA has been for television and SAG has been for film. And SAG movies have been shot on film and television has been shot on videotape. And nowadays, just about everything is going to be shot on digital. So the, the distinction, you know, doesn't make a lot of sense. And clearly, from the point of view of representing actors and having more clout, if those two unions merged, it would probably be better for their members. Doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna be better for producers, right. you know, but for, but for actors, I think it's probably, you know, advantageous. I think from what I recall, there are, there are some pension issues that in the past that kind of maybe kept it from working out or some little technical things, but by and large, the AMPTP, in my opinion, is so clobbered the performance unions over the last couple of rounds that um, they can find a way to work it out at this time. It, it could hopefully be helpful to them. Yes. Um, since Website Guy brought that up, I had a question for you I know that I wanted to ask um, if you have any thoughts or opinions about net neutrality, um, legal implications of it, predictions, do you think the net will remain neutral or do you think it will go in an unneutral direction and what are the creative implications for that democratized playing field that we've just been talking about? Well, I, th I think that uh, I'm definitely in favor of net neutrality, meaning that everyone should have equal access to the internet, and you know, it, it would it would not be great if the major studios can get have a fast connection and independent filmmakers have a slow connection, you know. But but frankly, um, I don't quite understand why everyone doesn't have a much faster connection in the United States. You know, our internet is not as fast as some other countries. You know, um, and you know, I think we need to, need to really you know. Uh, build up the infrastructure, you know. But yeah, I mean, I don't think you want your cable company deciding, you know, 
who, who has access to the end user, the consumer, and who doesn't. I mean, that's, that's not, you know, a, a, a great situation. I mean, uh, that being said, you know, even with net neutrality, it's not a completely level playing field. Because even, even nowadays, you know, because of digital technology, you could buy a very impressive camera for $5,000 and make a very good movie, you know, for very little money. Um, and you can edit it on a, on a Macintosh computer uh, with Final Cut Pro, which I think costs $99 if you buy a computer from them. And you can do special effects and editing that 20 years ago needed a whole room full of technicians and, and, and equipment to do. And you can now do it on your laptop. Um, but where there's still a very unequal playing field is in marketing. Uh, you know, you can have a great film, but how do you get people to go to your website to see it? Uh, you know, Time Warner um, has ways it can promote its offerings. It, it, has, it has other media, you know, print media, television media, you know, where it can promote its, its offerings and let people know about it. So in the future, you know, TV Guide is going to be like the Yellow Pages, like the phone book. It's going to have every, everything could be in there, but that doesn't necessarily mean people are going to find you. And so the marketing issue is still a very, it's still a very still a big barrier. barrier. Yeah. What, what do you think legally? Is there any? Do you think net neutrality is safe with the law, or do you think the courts would favor uh, making it an unneutral net? Well, I don't think it's it's primarily with the courts. It, it's it's primarily with the legislative bodies. With the it's with the FCC and with with Congress. Sure. It's hard. It's hard to predict what Congress will do. <laughs> you know, these days I can't say I have a great deal of confidence in their in their judgment, considering their track record on many other issues. Um, you know, and and it frankly has to do with you know big companies, you know, the big, the big carriers having a lot of lobbyists and being able to, you know, get their point of view across and, and having a lot of influence and, and the great unwashed masses, you know, independent filmmakers or whatever, not having as much clout. But um, based on what you were saying before, it, it strikes me that you think it, it is an issue for filmmakers. It's worth them being aware of it. Absolutely. And, and advocating on behalf of keeping it neutral. Yes. Okay. Whimsy would like to ask, if a filmmaker has a film made but is looking for money mainly for music clearances, where is the best place to go for that? And then um, he asked Kickstarter, which is great, because I wanted to ask you what you think of crowdfunding and websites like uh, Kickstarter and Indiegogo. So first, let's deal with uh, Whimsy's question about music clearance. Well, for, for independent films, um, I would advise not spending a lot of money on music because um, uh, generally speaking, independent films, there is no soundtrack album that's released because record companies that release soundtrack albums are seeking to capitalize upon the awareness of the film. And that means they want films that get a lot of a big theatrical release and a lot of money spent marketing them. So it's very rare that independent film has a soundtrack album. And uh, most films, you know, uh, if you put expensive music on there, if you spend $30,000 to get a Bruce Springsteen song or go with some unknown artist, it's not going to make a bit of difference as far as what kind of receipts are going to come in, and it's a huge expense. And so I would say, generally speaking, um, you don't want to spend a lot of money on music. And you can often get music for not a lot of money because there's a whole bunch of composers that want to break into the soundtrack business. And Composers, even if you if you get a composer to give you a composition, give, create for you an original score, you know, and you you create the score on a synthesizer, it's, it can be very inexpensive, and the composer is going to benefit. Even if you pay them nothing, they're going to benefit because they're going to get ASCAP or BMI royalties if if that um, film gets shown on television or in theaters abroad. So ASCAP and BMI, the two, uh, I guess, unions for musicians, they track the royalties that... They're not unions for musicians. They're performing... Performing... Uh, performing... Uh, they, they represent uh, music rights owners. It's music ASCAP, rights BMI, owners. and yes. SASAC in the United States. Mm -hmm. And there's analogous organizations in many Abroad. other foreign countries. Right. And basically, they collect money, public performance royalties, whenever the music is publicly performed. And in the case of the film, that would be in a theater outside the United States, but for historical reasons, not in the United States. Um, and on television, that's a public performance, and some money will come in uh, to the artists, the musician, the composer's uh, representative, whether it's ASCAP or BMI. These are not government agencies. These sure. are private right. agencies. So crowdfunding, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, um, places where 
filmmakers can set up web pages and solicit uh, money for their projects, for their films. Um, I've heard pros and cons about these things. I've heard legal, not legal. Are you familiar with them, and what's your thoughts on them? I'm familiar with some of them, and, and um, the ones you just mentioned, I believe, are, are for filmmakers to seek donations. And donations are basically gifts, and you can do that. That's legal. What, what you can't necessarily do is solicit investments and the difference between an investment and a gift is this. If, if you get a gift, um, someone is giving, you, giving it to you and expecting nothing in return. They're not getting a share of the profits. They're not going to, if the film is a big hit, they're not going to get paid back their capital. But an investment is quite different. And so there's all kinds of laws, security laws, that regulate investments. And they're designed to protect investors. And a lot of them were enacted after the Great Depression. Um, and they, they basically require um, the promoter, the filmmaker in this case, to make full disclosure of all the risks to investors. And usually um, there, it's a private offering and you can't publicly solicit strangers and you have to deal with people you have a pre-existing relationship with. So if there's a site that's seeking investments, um, there's a good chance it's probably violating the law. Um, and the, the promoters can be sent to jail or they can be sued by the investors to get their money back. Um, but if it's donations that are being asked for, and Kickstarter, you know, a lot of the donations are pretty modest in amounts, but uh, there's nothing wrong wrong with that. Okay. And they're very clear that it, that it's donations, and you you know, and for your for your gift, you maybe you're getting you know a baseball cap, or you're getting to getting you know an ongoing report of how it's going with the film. But you're not you're not it's not an investment. You're not you're not owning a piece of the film. You're not you're not guaranteed that you're going to share in any of the returns. Fair enough. What is going on? What is the current update with tax incentives? Things like, uh, is it section 181? Is that, is that still going? Is that extended? Or what's going on with tax laws and incentives to invest? Section 181 is the federal tax incentive for films. And yes, it still exists. It's not clear whether we'll, how long it will exist, but it does exist. And basically, what it does is it offers investors accelerated depreciation. They can basically write off the investment in the same year that they make it, uh, rather than having it spread out over five or seven mm -hmm. years. Um, and, that's, and it's good and, and for investors, and it can, can be combined with state incentives. State incentives is about 40 states that, that offer incentives. Some of the most notable are Michigan, where you can get between 40 to 42% rebate, um, New York City, Georgia, New Mexico, you know, and um, for the right film, it can make a lot of sense to bring your production there. But the thing you have to realize about incentives are, is a lot, whether it's a good deal or not, depends a lot upon the script. Um, if you shoot your film in Michigan, you may be getting this big rebate, but if you're also having to bring in, fly in all these actors from out of town and put them up in hotels and give them a per diem and pay for the meals, that may offset a lot of the savings. So it depends upon the film. Okay, if you have a film that's set, you know, it's a surfing film, uh, shooting it in Michigan just may not make sense. Um, if you have a film that has to do with, with a lot of snow and climbing mountains, you know, putting it in Hawaii may not make any sense. The cost of bringing in the trucking in the snow is it, going to negate any of the tax incentives. So, um, so 181, though, we still, it's still going, but we don't know if it's going to end this year, next year. It's kind of up in the air. Right. Well, you can whenever any any whenever a Congress or a state legislature can go into session, they can always change right. the laws. Okay. So that that goes for okay. just about everything. So it's it's hard to say, and with the economy the way it is, it's there's no guarantee it will be extended. Okay. Fuck. Uh, I think I think 181 is in place until the end of. 2012. Wouldn't you say though that it's at least it's at least in place to the end of 2011. Yeah. Now tax breaks vary. Not all are good. Not all are bad. Wouldn't you say this is one that does spur investment and, and is worth the the tax break, if you will? Well, I think um, for a lot of states, tax in, uh, these production incentives clearly have paid off. You know, if you're a place like Michigan and you're offering a 40 42 percent rebate. 
uh, which they're doing, and which has led to a tremendous increase in production. It's very clear that all of a sudden the reason all these producers are going to Michigan is because of this tax incentive. It's not always that clear in a place like California whether having a tax incentive is inducing people to shoot here or they're just taking advantage of a tax incentive and would have shot here anyway. But can when, you tell, like in the last 10 years, so much business has left California, it's gone to Canada, it's gone to New York, it's gone to other states? Runaway productions, I guess, is what they call it. That's that's true, but but even with these tax incentives, you know, it, 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 it there's still some people who are shooting in California. Absolutely. You know, one of the advantages of shooting in L.A. is, or New York, is you have a vast talent pool, and these people can, you know, a couple of years ago we shot a film on the outskirts of L.A. It's set in a forest, but believe it or not, within a few miles of L.A. you can be in a forest, and the great thing about shooting in L.A. is that the actors and the crew, everyone gets in their car, they come to the set in the morning, they work all day, and they go home. And you feed them during the day, but you know they go home, you don't have to pay for their hotel, you don't have to pay for their transportation, and you save a lot. And in LA, there's there's unbelievable number of actors that are available to do your film. Um, and that's not necessarily the case of getting a lot of experienced actors if you're out in the Midwest in a place where there isn't a big pool of actors or equipment and stuff. So you're shooting in LA, and your camera breaks down, within hours you'll be able to get a replacement part. You're shooting out you know, in Kansas, you may not be able to get that part till the next day, you might have to shut down. So there's a lot of pros and cons, and when you look at incentives, you have, it depends upon the script. If, if one state's incentive was clearly better than all the others for all films, everyone would be shooting there. You know, or all the films would be sh shot there, and that's not the case. Okay. Louisiana is also one that has a very attractive incentive. Absolutely, and you can always go to your Google search your state's film commission to check out what incentives might be going on in what state. Let's get to two more IMs. Fawad would like to ask, is it better distribution-wise to have a film more PG-13-ish rather than hard R? Well, I, I would say, um, I, I would say uh, there's a tremendous uh, um, glut of product in the marketplace. A lot of films are being made. I mean, the good news is because of technology, it's much less expensive to make a film than 20 years ago where you might need $100,000 just to pay for the film stock and the processing. And nowadays you can shoot digitally and you know if you shoot a scene and you don't like the way it's turning out, you hit the rewind button, you know, or you just reshoot it, you know. And, and so movies can be made very inexpensively, but Ironically, what's happened as a result is a whole bunch of movies are being made and it's increased the supply of movies and it's driven down the prices that they can fetch in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. So in some ways it's the best of times, but it's also the worst of times. So it's become more democratic and more accessible for people to make movies, but it's harder to get the amount of license fees that you used to get for the movies when there was a much more restricted supply. Um, that being said, I would say if you look at all the films out there, some, uh, for American independent films, um, often 80, 90% of the revenue comes in from abroad. The toughest market to crack is the US market. A lot of these films make their money in Europe, you know, especially European television. Um, Europeans have a little bit different taste than Americans. Uh, a film that's very violent and gory may not get on television there. They're, they're more adverse to violence, um, but they're more open to sex and nudity, okay? Uh, American audiences are relatively prudish in, in, in that regard. So you have to keep this in mind, and I would say that, relatively speaking, you know, even though there's a glut of product, there's probably less, much less of a glut of product for family films and you know, stories that can play in any day part. A lot of the big license fees are coming from European television, and they love you know, a Lassie type story because you can play at any time of the, of the day. You can play at 10 o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the afternoon, at late at night, whereas you have something that has a lot of sex or violence, it can only be played late at night, and there's an awful lot of films competing for those limited slots. So I would say, generally speaking, there's a relatively lack of, of, uh, of uh, family films some films are much harder to export than others. Comedies are notoriously different because something that's hysterically funny to you here in Los Angeles may not be funny to the people in Bulgaria. One thing you said to me, I'll never forget, and I've used it many, several times on this show, I've quoted you on it. You said to me six years ago, um, they don't get Woody Allen's humor west of New Jersey, <laughs> you know, right. let alone foreign countries. But uh, yeah, so the general is um, PG-13, if you have a U.S. theatrical release, is, is probably a little bit more preferable to R. 
but it gets back to knowing your audience, where you're gonna sell it, where you're gonna make your money, and so on. Last I am of the night is Cradle Will Rock. Um, I'm in the early stages of a documentary and I wanna use clips of celebrities in interviews that are relevant to my topic. Can I use clips or sound bites that are under 30 seconds without getting permission from the rights holder? It's kind of like a fair, fair use. use question. Yeah, the cop copyright law basically prohibits people from distributing or duplicating your copyrighted work um, without your permission except in limited circumstances. Um, one exception is something that's fallen into public domain. A copyright has expired. Anything that's in the public domain, you're free to use. Um, another is what's called the fair use defense, um, which could include you know, a parody. Um, there is no 30 second rule or three bar rule in music, okay? Uh, the fair use defense is, is uh, based upon four different criteria and a lot depends upon how it's, how it's being used. Um, I would say a documentary is more likely to be able to qualify for fair use for clips than, than a narrative film. Let me know, ask you real quick. Film. Um, you, you worked on a documentary on Forks Over Knives. Yes. And in the early parts of that documentary, you see clips from uh, Bill Maher on his show. You see the First Lady, uh, Mrs. Obama speaking. W were those things that you had to secure the rights for, or did you just use them under fair use? Well, <clears throat> Um, it, for that particular film, almost everything was licensed, and it was very little reliance upon fair use. It's, a, it's often a gray area, and it's hard to say sometimes whether or not you need the license. But generally speaking, um, the shorter the clip, uh, uh, the more likely it would be a fair use. If you're not competing with the original author, it's more likely a fair use. If you're using it for scholarship or nonprofit purposes or if, you're, if, you're, if it's a transformative work where, uh, f for instance, if you're doing a review, you, know, uh, you, can, you, can, you can take a quote out of an existing book in your review and that's considered a fair use. Um, so it's a matter of degree. You know? So if a school teacher wants to photocopy on one occasion an article from Newsweek and pass it out to the class for discussion, that's clearly a fair use. But if the, if the school teacher wants to save the, the students the cost of buying the textbook and wants to take her textbook down to the photocopy spot and run them off and give them to the students, that's not a fair use. Okay. Now the question we like to get everyone out of here on is, let's see uh, how often you get down to set. Do you have a favorite set speak term? Like for example, back to one or checking the gate or martini shot? No. Okay. <laughs> For a lot of my films, I don't even visit the set. Fair enough. <laughs> I'm back in the office doing the paperwork. There you go. Well, it's been a pleasure talking to you and having you on. Thank a lot you. of great information. You're very welcome. That is going to do it for this edition of Film Nut. Once again, I want to thank my guest, Mark Litwack. And if you enjoyed listening to information on this topic, go to the Film Nut archive and check out um, an old interview with Bianca Bezdek, where we also talk about legal issues as it pertains to film and television. Uh, if you missed any of this episode or any past episode, you can catch them all on demand at the stream.tv slash Film Nut. This episode should be up within about a week. Thanks again for surfing in and for all your questions, and we'll see you next time on Film Nut. Thank you.